Welcome to class 9, unit 2, Lexicalization Patterns. Overview of this class, Leonard Talmy's short biography, Cognitive Linguistics Brief Overview, Satellite versus Verb Frame Languages, and Lexicalization Patterns to a Cognitive Semantics by Leonard Talmy. Leonard Talmy is a professor of linguistics at the University of Buffalo, New York. He's known for his pioneering work in cognitive linguistics. He explored the relationship between semantic and formal linguistic structures and the connections between semantic typologies and language universals. Let's have a, a brief overview of cognitive linguistics. Cognitive linguistics was born as a reaction against traditional grammar and formal approaches to language, such as Chomsky's generative grammar. Cognitive linguistics does not consider language as a modular system in our brains, but rather claims that language and cognition are embodied. That is to say that our linguistic and conceptual categories are grounded in physical social and cultural experience. Cognitive linguistics rejects points of widespread agreement, such as the fact that language is an innate and autonomous cognitive faculty, or that to know a language is to know its grammar. And finally, that form is the main focus of linguistic analysis rather than meaning. Let's have a look at satellite and verb frame languages. Depending on where motion and path are expressed, whether in the root verb or in a satellite, we can speak of two language typologies. If the semantic notion of motion and path is expressed in the root verb, we are speaking about a verb-framed language. Uh, Romance languages are typically verb-framed. Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, French, Romanian. Uh, on the other hand, if the expression of motion and, and of motion is expressed in the root verb, but path is expressed in a satellite, outside the root verb, then we are speaking about satellite frame languages, namely Germanic languages, German, Dutch, Norwegian, English, among others. Well, um, the expression of motion and path, or rather the fact that motion and path may be either expressed or may conflate in the root verb or in the root verb and in a satellite has an incidence in the expression of manner. So, in the case of verb frame languages in which motion and path are encoded in the root verb, manner is encoded outside the root verb or not encoded at all. In the case of satellite frame languages in which path is encoded outside the root verb in a satellite, motion and manner are usually encoded in the root verb, or they usually conflate, those meanings conflate together in the root verb. Um, so let's have a look at these examples, which are very graphic. Um, in Spanish, we may say something like, Salir arrastrándose. Salir is a verb that, or in which the meanings of motion and trajectory direction conflate. That is to say, salir implies motion and a trajectory, out, outside. However, there is no manner. So if we say, Salió del campo de batalla, no sabemos si salió caminando, corriendo o arrastrándose. We could say que salió arrastrándose. In English, we would say something like the soldier crept out of the battlefield. So, creep 
is a motion verb in which the semantic notion of motion and manner conflate. However, trajectory or direction is expressed outside in a satellite. Out. Creep. Out. Okay. Now um, I'm going to uh, focus on the main aspects to bear in mind as to uh, what Leonard Talmy argues in his article, in his seminal article, Lexicalization Patterns Toward a Cognitive Semantics. Um, I want to make it clear that um, Leonard Talmy deals with uh, translational motion and um, location and static location, but uh, we are not going to be dealing with static location. We are going to concentrate only on translational motion. Well, some of the main aims of this study are to explore systematic relations between meaning and surface expression, to explore cases that constitute a pervasive pattern, a pervasive means a frequent pattern, and describe their features within a language, for example, English, and across languages, English in comparison to other languages, in our case, of course, in comparison to Spanish. To focus on the most characteristic expression of motion and manner, which will be colloquial and frequent rather than stilted and occasional. That is to say, um, we are going to concentrate and analyze examples that are typical of colloquial English, right? And therefore typical of its typology. Leonard Talmy holds that a meaning can be associated with a surface form by three processes, by deletion, by lexicalization, and by interpretation. In our case, we are, only to we are going to concentrate only on lexicalization, which is when a semantic entity is found to be in regular association with a particular lexical form. Remember that his binary typology is called lexicalization patterns. So the meaning of the word, word pattern is vital to understand this typology. The Cambridge Dictionary defines pattern as one of the definitions is a particular way in which something happens or is done. Another definition is any regular or repeated arrangement of things. So what we are going to do is study the particular way in which motion, path and manner are expressed in English and in Spanish. Okay, systematic relations in language between meaning and surface expressions. As regards the domain of meaning, which are the semantic entities we are going to focus on? Which are the meanings, the notions we are going to focus on? The meaning of motion, of course, path or trajectory, figure, the thing or person that moves, ground, the place um, with respect to which this figure moves, manner, the manner of motion, and sometimes the cause of motion. Now, these semantic entities are lexicalized, are expressed by means of different surface entities. That is to say, the surface entities belong in the domain of surface expression. That is to say, concrete words. So nouns will lexicalize figure, for example, or ground. Verbs will lexicalize or realize motion. Adpositions, which means both prepositions and postpositions, 
In our case, English and Spanish only have prepositions. May lexicalize path in the case of Spanish. Uh, prepositions in Spanish may lexicalize path. Subordinate clauses, which can lexicalize manner, right? Gerundial, um, gerundives in Spanish, right? Participial clauses in English. Adverbials. So, these entities belong in the domain of surface expression. And of course, satellites. Satellites are completely new to you. They were coined by Leonard Talmy and they um, are used only in this approach. We are going to study them in detail in a minute. So, um, what is the method Leonard Talmy applies? to explore meaning surface relations. He applies two main directions. So he says that we can hold a semantic entity constant and observe the surface entities in which it appears. That is to say, we may hold motion constant and observe the surface entities in which it appears. In general, it will be verbs. We may hold manner constant and observe in which surface entities it appears. And we will see that in the case of English, many a times it appears in the root verb, while in the case of Spanish, many a times it appears outside the root verb in a different constituent. The other possible direction is to hold a surface entity constant, that is to say a word, to study, to see what happens with an adverbial particle or with a verb or with an adverbial a circumstantial and observe which semantic entities are expressed in it. So we may hold prepositions between inverted commas because they will not always be prepositions like up, down, on in English and see what type of meanings they express. Okay, which will be our unit of analysis? Instead of speaking of a simple sentence, we are going to be speaking of a basic motion event. A motion event is a situation expressing motion, which consists of four internal components. An object, which is the figure, moving with respect to a reference object to another object, which is the ground. An expression of movement, that is to say the meaning of motion, and a trajectory followed, a path. So a trajectory followed by the figure. Um, these four internal components must always be present. Additionally, a motion event can be associated with an external co-event uh, that bears a relation of manner or cause. So the meanings of manner or cause are co-events that occur, they co-occur together with motion, either manner or cause. Motion events are classified, or we are going to be classifying motion events as propositions. So we are going to be speaking about non-agentive propositions, agentive and self-agentive propositions. Why? Okay. Or what are we going to be paying attention to? Depending on whether the figure is animate or inanimate, so an animate being or an inanimate being, a person, an animal, or a thing, or depending on whether the figure moves by itself with its own internal energy, or is moved by an external agent, by something or somebody else, we can speak of non-agentive propositions. For example, water boiled out through the crack, 
water is the figure and is an inanimate being. That's why it's non-agentive. Or an agentive proposition, he bounced the ball around the pitch. The figure is the ball, not he, because what bounced, lo que hacían rebotar, era la pelota. He bounced the ball around the pitch. And self-agentive propositions, when the force, let's say, comes from within the figure. He jumped into the car and drove off. If you pay attention to these examples, they are very idiomatic in English. Water boiled out through the crack. He bounced the ball around the pitch and he jumped into the car and drove off. If we wanted to translate them into Spanish, um, we would find this a little bit difficult. It is not impossible because, as we know, any meaning can be translated into any language. But since these structures are so typical of the English typology, of the satellite frame typology, it is difficult, in a way, to translate them into Spanish. We have to think of um, alternatives that will not be simple sentences. So water boiled out through the crack would be something like El agua estaba hirviendo y se salió por la grieta o por la fisura. He bounced the ball around the pitch. Is not el, el eh, picó la pelota alrededor de la cancha. No, es el hizo picar o corría por la cancha alrededor de la cancha haciendo picar la pelota. We need two propositions. And the same goes for he jumped into the car and drove off. Saltó adentro del auto. Saltó hacia adentro, porque no saltaba adentro, sino que saltó y terminó adentro. So, bear in mind these uh, cases so that you understand what comes next. The previous examples, the one we have, we have just Analyzed, illustrate colloquial expressions typical of the English typology. Water boiled out the crack. Notice that the verbs conflating motion and manner or cause have a more basic counterpart. So these verbs we have just analyzed have a more basic counterpart that does not imply translational motion. Translational motion means motion that implies a trajectory. Let's go back. Water boiled out the, uh, sorry, boiled out through the, the crack. El agua hirvió y salió por la eh, grieta, ¿sí? O por la fisura. So, on the one hand, we need two um, clauses, and on the other hand, if we pay attention to the verb to boil, in general, to boil doesn't imply translational movement. So, to boil is static movement, if you want. The same goes for bounce, rebotar. A ball can bounce up and down in exactly the same place. Uh, there is no... Um, implication of a direction, right? We know it's up and down, yes, but that does not mean um, that it will follow a trajectory out, around, or along, right? So the fact that um, there is a satellite in relation to the root verb adds this meaning of trajectory. The same goes for jump. So, as I was saying, if you pay attention to the water boiled or the ball was bouncing or he was jumping, he jumped, these um, are the more basic counter, counterpart of those verbs. And this time, there is no translational motion implied. So, by removing the satellites, the, the water boiled out through the crack, we get their more, the, the more basic meaning of these verbs, which do not imply translational motion. 
These type of verbs are called lexical doublets. The typical lexical doublet, um, the prototypical one, is the verb to float. So, um, a boat can float on the water. So, there's static, it's static on the water. It's maybe there's a buoyancy movement, but there's no trajectory followed by the boat. But I can say the boat floated into the cave. Then you're going to, we're going to share a video by Leonard Talmy <clears throat> where he gives this example. So these are lexical doublets. It's typical of satellite frame languages and it's when a verb uh, that is used in a verb uh, complex along with a satellite implying or denoting trajectory has a more basic counterpart without this satellite that does not imply translational movement. That's a lexical doublet. Okay, let's go further into satellites in English. As I said, <clears throat> satellites are typical of satellite frame languages, of course. So we're not going to be speaking about satellites in Spanish. Although some authors and even Talmi himself speaks about some Romance languages like French, saying that there are certain pronominal verbs in which the pronoun functions as a satellite. But they are exceptional cases and we are not going to be dealing with them in this presentation at least. So what you have to remember uh, for our purposes is that satellites will only pertain to English. Okay, a satellite is a grammatical category. So satellite is as if you were saying verb or adverbial. A grammatical category that is in sister relation to the verb root and together they form a single constituent, the verb complex. This um, use of meta language is very important. If you say, she uh, went out, went out is the verb complex, went is the verb root, and out is the satellite. Satellites are usually realized by verb particles, but sometimes they overlap with prepositions, and when they do, they are classified as sat preps, satellites and prepositions. Note, the words together, apart, and forth are only satellites. They can never work as prepositions, while of, from, and to words serve only as prepositions. They can never be satellites. But there are many other words that can be both, depending on the use, right? Depending on the context, they can be either a satellite, a preposition, or a sat prep. Let's see. In English, path is usually expressed fully by the combination of a satellite and a preposition. So it's mainly expressed in the satellite, but on other occasions, it is, it is expressed in the satellite together with the preposition. And the preposition also contributes to this. So if you have... Let's analyze this example. Um, ah, well, there's a mixture with, don't pay attention to the arrows. I added something, so forget about these arrows. When I heard the explosion, I ran out of the house. The, the arrow meant sat was for satellite, out, and prep stands for preposition of. I ran out of the house. So, ran out is the verb complex, run is the verb root, out is a satellite, and of is a preposition that helps to fully express path and, the, and, the, and at the same time to introduce the ground nominal. The ground nominal is the house. Why is it that I say ground nominal? Because it is the ground and because it is a noun phrase. A nominal, round nominal. A satellite, now let's, let's um, 
have a look at a fee, uh, other features that distinguish satellites from propositions. A satellite, like out, is in construction with a verb. So, it, it is in sister relation with the verb. That's why it's called a satellite. Like the moon. The moon is the satellite to the earth and it exists as a satellite because the earth exists. If the earth disappeared, there would be no more satellite, let's say. So a satellite is in construction with a verb, while a preposition is in construction with a noun. Remember in first year when we studied that a noun phrase, like the house, in this case the ground, is the object or can be the object of a preposition. Well, it's related to this, that a preposition is in construction with a noun. The preposition contains the ground nominal. It introduces the ground nominal, right? Or as we said in traditional grammar, the ground nominal, the noun phrase, is the object of the preposition. And if the ground is omitted, the preposition should be omitted too. But the satellite will remain. How? If you say something like, when I heard the explosion, I ran out. The ground nominal, the ground, has been omitted, and so has the preposition. I cannot say, when I heard the explosion, I ran out of. Because the moment I say of, I need, it calls for the presence of a noun phrase. In this case, the ground nominal. What is a sat prep, satellite preposition? Some forms, like past or through, are satellites when the ground nominal has been omitted, but when the ground is explicit, has not been omitted, they introduce the noun phrase, so this ground nominal, but get a heavy stress. So you can say something like, I saw him, but he walked past. If you say, I saw him, but he walked past, which would be translated as, think for a second, ¿cómo traducirían? I saw him, but he walked past. Lo vi, pero siguió de largo, pasó de largo. No diríamos caminó de largo, no, no expresamos la manera nosotros de esa forma. Paso de largo. Now, he walked past, past is a satellite. Uh, if me, which is the ground, because me, myself, would be the uh, object with respect to which the figure moves. If it is omitted, past is just a satellite. But if it is retained, if me were retained, this object pronoun, I saw him, but he walked past me, we would say that past is a sat prep. It, it serves two functions. It denotes path trajectory and it introduces the ground nominal me, just as of, in the previous example, introduced the ground nominal the house. I ran out of the house. Of is in sister relationship, let's say, with the noun. Past is a sad prep because, precisely because, if the ground nominal is omitted, it will just be a satellite, but if it's retained, it would be a preposition, but also a satellite, so a sat prep. Another example, suppose you, you go to the lake uh, during winter and your kids want to swim, want to go into the water, and you say, we'll swim across the lake, but when the summer comes, will swim across the lake. Swim across is the verb complex. Swim is the root verb, which conflates motion and manner. And across is the satellite that, that denotes path. Now, if the lake, which is the ground, is omitted, across is a satellite. If it is retained, we'll swim across the lake, it's a sat prep. 
because it serves both functions, that of a satellite indicating direction and that of a preposition containing, let's say, um, the, the ground nominal, the noun phrase. Okay, let's have a look at some special uh, cases of satellites. So we have seen so far that satellites uh, generally um, denote path, uh, mainly because we are concentrating on translational motion that implies a trajectory. But there are um, satellites that express meanings other than, there's a mistake, not that, other than path. And they denote, for example, aspect. Remember, we have already seen the unit on verbs and aspect, and we spoke about uh, imperfective aspectual meaning when it means um, progression, ongoing situation, or perfective aspectual meaning when it means complete situation, or inchoative meaning when it means the beginning of a situation. So, in the sentence, I checked off the names on the list, which is so idiomatic and so typical of the English typology, off is a satellite that denotes aspect, because if we wanted to translate, I mean, the meaning is that I checked all the names, all of them. The translation to this sentence could be controle todos los nombres que estaban en la lista. Todos los nombres. So, I check them off. So, this off gives this, denotes this meaning of perfective aspectual meaning. In the second case, when, he, when she saw me, she just walked on. Walked on is a verb complex. Walk is the root verb and on is the satellite, but it does not denote path. We are not speaking about a trajectory followed. It's not she walked on the bridge, something like that. But she continued walking. She walked on, she continued walking. So this would be imperfective aspectual meaning. Cuando me vio, siguió caminando. Satellites, well, there are lots of examples in the, in the article by Leonard Talmy uh, uploaded in the virtual classroom. So please uh, read it so that you can be familiarized, you become familiar with all these examples. Satellites, um, which are not adverbial particles, uh, there are satellites which are not adverbial particles, that is to say, on, up, off. And they are not adverbial particles, they may be adjectives, for example. And apart from not being uh, adverbial particles, they express or they denote a resulting state or an end location of the figure. That is to say, they neither denote aspect nor trajectory, but the resulting state or the resulting place where the figure ended. For example, she swam clear of the oncoming ship. For example, a ship was coming or a motorboat was coming and she swam clear of it. She swam clear. This is very idiomatic and difficult to translate, but we can picture what happened. So what happened is that this motorboat boat was approaching and the girl swam away. Se, se nadó y se fue bien lejos, diríamos en español. Nadó bien lejos del, del barco que venía o de la lancha que venía. Uh, swam clear is a verb complex. Swam is the root verb and clear is a satellite, but it's an adjective, right? and it expresses the end location of the figure. Empezó nadando cerca del barco y terminó lejos del barco, end location of the figure. Another very idiomatic expression, for example, the coin melted free, melted free from the eyes. We have to picture a whole situation to understand this. So imagine you live in the south of our country in 
uh, Ushuaia, and um, one day you you drop a coin uh, in the morning, and when you come back in the afternoon, it's so cold that the coin is under a layer of ice, and you cannot take it out because it's covered by this layer of ice. Well, that can be the situation for one, two, three months, and when spring comes and the ice melts, then you can remove the coin, and you would say something like, the coin melted free. So free would be a satellite, again, an adjective, expressing not in location of the figure, the coin, but resulting state. Estaba atrapada en el hielo y ahora está suelta. ¿Cómo traduciríamos esto? Es, no, o sea, como siempre digo, no imposible de traducir. Por supuesto que todo se puede traducir. Pero we cannot, uh, or we should be very careful not to try and make a literal translation. La moneda se derritió libre, no tiene ningún sentido. El hielo se derritió y la moneda se salió. O algo así. So this is just for you to see that satellites are not always adverbial particles and that satellites do not always denote path. Another example, the door swung shut. It's end, um, sorry, resulting state. It was open, it swung, and then it was shut. And finally, let's have a look at the notion of salience in the verb complex. And this you are going to, this is the introduction to, to this, um, let's say, aspect of lexicalization patterns, which you are going to see more in detail uh, when you read slobbing and ask, but mainly slobbing. Salience in the verb complex. Salience is the degree to which a component of meaning, remember that a component of meaning in, um, in, the, in, the, in the motion event could be manner, motion, right figure, that's a component of meaning. The degree to which a component of meaning either emerges into the foreground of attention or remains in the background where it attracts little attention. Um, in this particular case, we are going to be paying attention to manner. In general, when we speak about salience, the component of meaning we are thinking about is manner. So the degree to which manner either emerges into the foreground of attention or remains in the background hidden where it attracts little attention, but, but it's present. So backgrounding, what is backgrounding? When a semantic entity, usually manner, is backgrounded in the verb complex. That is to say, it's expressed in the verb. The very famous ways of, typical of the English language. It's ways of walking, ways of running, ways of holding, ways of looking, right? So, manner is backgrounded. It is in the verb, but backgrounded. And foregrounding is when the semantic entity, again, usually manner, is made explicit outside the verb complex. And it's, in general, in Spanish, when we express manner in what uh, Talmi has come to call a gerundive, and in Spanish would be un gerundio, but not a gerund, not a gerund, not the English gerund, gerundive or un gerundio, or perifrasis de gerundio in Spanish, gerundio. Okay, manner salience in English and Spanish. So, in English, manner of motion is, there's a mistake, is often backgrounded and thus readily expressed with apparently low cognitive cost. What's the meaning of with apparently low cognitive cost? It means that 
the listener or the reader doesn't need to make an effort to understand the meaning of, of manner denoted. So if you say something like, she flew to England, that's easy to understand that it means that she went by plane. Hmm? So that's low cognitive cost. There's little effort on the part of the listener or reader. In Spanish, manner is either foregrounded in a constituent other than, again, same mistake, I'm sorry, other than the verb, uh, generally a gerundive, or omitted altogether. So, um, in Spanish, we seldom express or denote manner. That doesn't mean that English is better than Spanish. They are different uh, languages. And if we do foreground manner, sometimes that is, or if we do think of verbs conflating motion and manner, there are some verbs conflating motion and manner, maybe the result would be an awkward realization. So, as a result, we can say that English can pack more information and manner in a backgrounded fashion, right? Okay, to finish the, this presentation, let's have a look at some interesting contrasting features. So, in English, we can say that satellites are typical of satellite frame languages of, of English, in this case. Um, in Spanish, there are no satellites. In English, conflation of motion and path is also possible in English root verbs. So, this is connected to what we said at the beginning of the year and what we say all the time, that all typologies leak. That is to say, there are exceptions. So, even though English is a satellite frame language, sometimes motion and path can conflate in the root verb. For example, in the verb enter of Latin origin, descend of Latin origin, we know the direction, return, cross. Rise is not of Latin origin, but we know it means up. In Spanish, path is encoded in prepositions or conflated with motion in the root verb. So path is not encoded in satellites in Spanish. And it's conflated with motion in root verbs. Again, in Spanish, conflation of motion and manner is also possible, even though it's typical of English, because all typologies leak and there are exceptions, this is also possible in Spanish. So we have verbs like vadear, aletear, marchar. Aletear es mover la sala una y otra vez. Marchar es caminar con pasos largos o como si fuera un soldado. Y vadear, se los dejo que los busquen en el diccionario y luego me digan en clase qué es vadear y cuál sería la traducción al inglés o el equivalente. Lexical doublets are frequent in English, remember? Uh, like float. Uh, the boat was floating on the pond or floated into the cave. And lexical doublets do not exist in Spanish. Hmm? Then we are going to see more examples in class. But they are non-existent in Spanish. Um, finally, English can background information of manner, cause, and even complex trajectory in a simple sentence. By complex trajectory, I mean when there are multiple steps in the journey. This is something you're going to read in Slobbing, is when you say things like, he ran out of the room, down the stairs, into the cellar. So, he ran, only one verb, conflating motion and manner, and three trajectories attached to the same verb. He ran out of the room, down the stairs, and into the cellar. That is non-existence in, in Spanish. No podemos decir, salió corriendo de la habitación 
para abajo de la escalera, adentro del sótano. No, that's impossible. We need three different closets. Salió corriendo de la, de la habitación, un nuevo verbo, bajó las escaleras y un nuevo verbo entró al sótano. While in, in Spanish, an attempted inclusion of all this information in a simple sentence, lo que yo recién acabo de tratar de hacer, would result in an awkward, not natural expression, lo que yo acabo de ejemplificar. Muy bien, let's put the theory into practice. Here we have a very short excerpt from an extract from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. At the very beginning, it says, None of them notice a large tawny owl flutter past the window. Later on, it says, He hopped into his car and backed out of number four's drive. Number four's drive is the address. So, a large tawny owl, una lechuza grande, marrón, amarronada, um, how would you, I, I'm sure you understand this, but think about how you would translate it. I'll, I'll give you a, a minute. None of them notice a large tony owl flutter past the window. The figure is the owl, flutter past is the verb complex. Um, the verb root is flutter, past is as, it, it denotes Path, it's a sad prep because at the same time it introduces the ground nominal, the window. Flutter past the window. And then he hopped into his car, like he jumped into his car and backed out of number four's drive. Saltó de un saltito dentro del auto, o cómo lo traduciría? And backed out of number four's drive. Let's see. Try and think of a possible translation, and I'll show you. Ninguno de ellos notó la gran lechuza rojiza que pasaba volando por la ventana. Incluso podríamos omitir la manera, volando, that is, manner is foregrounded in a gerundive, en un gerundio, Podríamos decir simplemente, na, ninguno de ellos notó la lechuza rojiza que pasaba por la ventana. We omit manner because for us it's obvious, it's a different language. And eh, if we said something like, ninguno notó la lechuza rojiza que aleteaba y pasaba por la ventana, that implies a high cognitive cost, not low cognitive cost. It's like we have to make an effort to understand. Hmm? Then he hopped into his car, simplemente se metió su coche. So again, manner is not expressed in Spanish. Y se alejó and backed out of number four's drive. In the case of backed out, probably we could say that back conflates motion and path. Uh, we don't know how he did it, but we know that the direction is backwards. So here you are an analysis, right? This is a very simple one. Motion, flutter, conflate, motion and manner. We say conflate when two meanings are expressed in one word, in the root verb. And in this case, past, past denotes, we don't say conflate, denotes because it's only one meaning, um, path. Hmm? Manner, in this case, is expressed outside the verb. And ground is introduced by the preposition. Past is a sad prep because it denotes path and at the same time it introduces the ground nominal. Okay. In the case of he backed out, backed, 
conflates motion and path, and we can say that path is further elaborated in the um, in the satellite out, backed out. So we know that the direction is backwards, but at the same time, it means que se hizo marcha atrás y que se fue, las dos cosas, right? Okay. Well, for homework, I would like you to do the following. We have this very short context. Estábamos de campamento en una montaña, era de noche y llovía cántaros. De pronto, una roca, una piedra, pasó rodando por al lado de nuestra carpa. O sea, en el medio de la tormenta, un diluvio, ¿sí? Hay como una avalancha, una roca pasó rodando por el lado de nuestra carpa. How would you translate the underlined sentence into colloquial English so that it best reflects its typology? So please find the translation and analyze it this, and compare it with the Spanish version. Um, speak about manner salience if it is uh, relevant. Decide if it's a case of correspondence or non-correspondence. Identify the proposition and say whether it is agentive, non-agentive, or self-agentive, right? All the topics I have tackled in this presentation. Well, this is the end of the class. Thank you. See you on Friday.